This is ESG Decoded, the podcast powered by Global Affairs Associates to provide relevant, actionable updates related to business innovation and sustainability. Join Caitlin Allen and Amanda Shea of Global Affairs Associates for thoughtful, nuanced conversations with industry leaders that explore the complexities, the risks, and the opportunities connected to all things ESG. I'm Yvonne Harris, a consultant and co-host, and I will be collaborating with Caitlin and Amanda for the discussions that we will present on this podcast. Put simply, ESG is everything that is not on your balance sheet. This leaves room for misunderstanding, oversimplification, and the tendency towards one-size-fits-all perspectives. None of that will happen on this podcast. Enjoy this episode. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm Amanda Shea, and today I'm excited to be speaking with Fariel Kanbabi, the CEO of Dialyte Group and also the chairman of the Dialyte Foundation. Fariel is also the 2020 winner of the Silver Stevie Award in the Women of the Year Manufacturing category. Dialyte is a world leader in LED industrial lighting technology with millions of LED lights installed around the world. It launched its first LED product, 51 years ago, and is continuing to innovate in the LED lighting technology space. I'm really excited to be speaking about board diversity and sustainability at a global manufacturer. And Dialyte's also listed on the London Stock Exchange, so it's a little bit different perspective than most of our guests. Mario, welcome to ESG Decoded. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks very much for having me. I wanted to first talk a little bit about your gender balanced board. Board diversity is a big topic in ESG because studies have shown, one, that diverse boards make better decisions and better decisions can result in better financial performance. I think also just thinking about social impact as well. How can we promote more women and minorities on boards and in a leadership position? So when I learned that Dialyte has a gender balanced board, my first question in my head was, okay, how did you achieve this? Well, we are actually, I'm very proud to say, the only gender balanced um, board on the London Stock Exchange. And actually we're the only board with a female CEO and a female chairman. So, I mean, that's, that's quite an achievement. I mean, you're absolutely right. There is, um, you know, many studies have shown that, you know, where you have balance in terms of gender and diversity, companies perform better. I mean, if you just look at the pandemic alone and you actually look at the countries that have been governed by, by women, they tended to fare a little bit better during the COVID crisis than some of the counterparts. I mean, we have strived very hard to have that diversity. I mean, our previous chairman is a great advocate for women. He runs a very large sustainability mm-hmm. fund. So, you know, we're, we're very proud to be in this position. But, you know, the board also functions extremely well. It's probably the, you know, definitely the best functioning board I've had the um, pleasure of being part of. And we all, you know, come at things from from different angles. And I think having those perspectives, not only in terms of male, female, but just the cultural diversity is is really important when you're running a global business. You know, what works in the US isn't going to necessarily work in Europe or or work in in Asia Pac. So we we do feel that we are well placed. In, in terms of the decision making for a global company like Dialyte. What do you, you see as the barriers for companies having more diverse board of directors? I, I, I think there's still a lot of gender stereotype and, you know, you almost, I mean, I remember very early on in my career, you're almost made to feel that you've got to be more man than, than woman. And I think that's a really wrong message to give our young women coming up through through the ranks because you know you you're, you're bringing your perspective as a woman, so you 
you know, we, I think as women have more self-awareness, we're probably much harder on ourselves than any males could ever be. But we also come with a lot more humility and, and empathy. And I think it takes both types to make things work in, in a board and, 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 and in a company. And I think there is still those glass ceilings. I think there is still a lot of the old boys network. I mean, and, and I think other women are not necessarily always supportive of, of other women. And I think we, as women, have to support each other to break those glass ceilings. I remember 10, 15 years ago, it was a long time ago, going to a job interview and the lady that interviewed me said, oh, I think your heels are too high. And I thought, you know what? I could run on a treadmill in my heels, but the fact that you said that means I definitely do not want to work for a company like this. And, and I think those are the things that we have to get past in terms of those barriers because it, it takes every kind of, of difference to make a company successful. And I think it's a great thing for other women and, and men, you know, regardless of what their cultural background is to see people from a diverse background in leadership positions because then they can sit back and think well you know what I don't have to be a middle-aged white male to (laughs) to to get somewhere in a company and I think that's super important. Is it okay if I ask you about your professional path and how you came to be CEO and chairman? Oh yeah absolutely absolutely if I, if I start with my path, I mean, I'm a chartered accountant, which is the equivalent of a CPA. So I came through the finance background. And actually, I, I spent the past five years as CFO of Dialyte. And I was appointed CEO of Dialyte the week before the world went into lockdown in March 2020. So it was a complete baptism of fire. My first CEO role in the middle of a pandemic, which none of us knew how that was going to be. So yeah, it's been a very interesting couple of years. I mean, I've worked in a lot of different industries. I've worked in oil and gas. I've worked in shipping, media, retail. But I actually grew up in Hong Kong and I spent the first eight years living on board a vessel where my father was the captain. So I I like to think of myself as a a child of the world because I've Yeah, I live in London now. I spent a lot of time in the US. I grew up in the Far East. So I feel that breadth of experience of working across different cultures has put me in a really strong position to work in the global companies I have done in my career. And incidentally, I've always, just about every job I've had, it's been in a very male-dominated environment. And I ask that because I think it's important not only to see women and minorities in leadership positions, but I think it's helpful for people to understand, you know, what does that career path potentially look like as well? And how, if you're a little girl somewhere, (laughs) how could it, you know, how can she become a CEO one day? I would also like to understand, like, what do you see that systematically needs to change to have more diverse boards? I've heard of different stock exchanges around the world, you know, requiring this for publicly traded companies. That's just one example. What's in, you know, on top of your mind when you think about how to increase board diversity? You know, I mean, you know, this is something I'm really quite passionate about because we, you know, there is different stock exchanges requiring, I mean, like recently in the U.S. where, you know, by a certain time you have to have, you know, two females on the board, but, but actually, that isn't what is important. It's actually about changing the mindset. So because I fit the, unfortunately, the over 50, the women and the ethnic, I get calls a lot to join boards. And, and you know, I mean, first of all, my role at Dialect is really, really busy, so I don't have time. But I don't want to be that tick box that sits on a board because you hit all three of those buckets. I mean, whereas we bring our own set of unique, authentic leadership style, and that's what we should be judged on. And I think the mindset has to change. They can't just be, you know, we can't be the token woman that, oh, yeah, isn't it great? We, you've got a woman on the board. Just let's hope she sits in the corner and keeps quiet. The other topic I wanted to kind of pivot to is sustainability at Dialyte. Mm-hmm. 
obviously you've been a leader in LED technology, which we all know is the most efficient lighting technology around. So helping, you know, folks reduce their electricity consumption. And also I would argue just more efficient, more safe. And I'm sure you can talk about more about that, but I would love to hear also more about sustainability within Dialyte. And I learned recently that you have a net zero by 2040 goal. So let's maybe start with there. Tell me okay. more about that goal and why 2040 early. Well, well what we, we're looking to do, I mean, there is a lot of greenwashing going on in, in a lot of different industries. And we are taking our whole commitment to net zero very, very seriously. And we want to do that by achieving net zero with scope one, two, and three emissions. So there is, you know, so, aspects that are inside our control, which we will hit a lot sooner than 2040. But there are other things outside that that we can't necessarily control, like how our components come to us, how we deliver to our customers. So that's why we picked 2040, because we want it to include all three of the scopes. We're also very heavily focused on looking at our designs and how can we make the first fully recyclable light fixture. And, you know, that means not only the, its lifespan, but what materials are we using? In, and then looking at the performance of that product, but also, you know, how can we certify the carbon footprint of those products, which makes it more valuable to our customers? We are also working at localizing our supply chain. So we. And at the moment with the global supply chain crisis, that is super, super important. We're also working with our logistic teams to work out how can we be greener? You know, how how can we reduce the carbon footprint of when we bring materials into our factories and when we deliver those out? And we're obviously working, you know, with our own internal factories in terms of putting solar power in, recycling the water. So there is, you know, a lot of work to do around this area, but we feel that it is very important that we hit this target without buying carbon credits. It's got, we as a company want to be net zero without just buying offsets. And that's not easy to do. I think- Not at all. I mean, I think carbon offsets are one of the many tools, you know, in our toolbox towards net zero. And, you know, they're, they're appropriate for certain things, just as a screwdriver is appropriate for a tool for certain, for screws, you know, but maybe not for nails. One thing I was thinking about is how sustainability can be this driver for business innovation, because it is a challenge. Maybe we can see other examples or maybe best practices, but how do we take that and really a make it our own, make it work for our company, for our unique situation, locations, constraints, et cetera, et cetera. So I, that's the part that fascinates me about sustainability is how it can be a driver for innovation. And like you were saying, there's still things that need to be figured out to reach that 2040 goal. But I think that can be a very powerful driver to reach that. Absolutely. I mean, and actually the conversion to LED for most, com- well, for every company out there is an, is a no brainer. I mean, we, you know, safety and, and the whole environment is at the heart of our business. And we really operate in, in, in the industrial side of the sector where there's a lot of high vibration, there's dust, there's humidity, heat, and our products have to last. And our products last five times longer than legacy lighting and twice as long as all of our competitors. We're very focused on product innovation. I mean, we recently launched our new ultra-efficient high bay, which is probably the most efficient heavy industrial fixture in the market. I mean, as I said earlier, we're, we're certifying all of our product groups so that our customers know what the carbon footprint of what they're buying. So it's not just about the energy savings we're working at also, you know, what happens when that fixture gets changed in 10, 15 years? I mean, if it ends up in a landfill, for me, that's not very sustainable. So how do we recycle that so that it's kinder to the environment? I also think about just circularity in general. Part of it is what do we do at the end of its life, but how do we also incorporate more 
recycled materials at the beginning yeah. of its life and just designed for circularity from the beginning. It's a challenge. It's hard. <laughs> We're very committed to launching a fully recyclable product by the end of this year. Our engineering technology team is working very hard to ensure that happens. And this will be a first to the market. That's exciting. I can't wait for that. Tell me how have employees reacted to Dialight's sustainability program, to the net zero goal? How are they responding? Well, you know, Dialight's always been about sustainability. And, and the really great thing that happened during this pandemic is suddenly the whole ESG agenda is so much higher up. I mean, if you just look at our the investors in, in Dialight, they're all sustainability funds. And what we've really done over the course of the last two years is, is get that message more. You know, so the employees have always known about it, but but we put, we're putting more structure around, well, actually, you know, this thing that we've been doing for the last 10 years, well, this is how it, it, it ties into what you're seeing in every newspaper and TV channel that, that you see every day. We are launching a training program. We obviously launched the Dialight Foundation because for me, the whole sustainability side is really important, the environment side. But, you know, what is equally and even more important is the S and ESG, is the whole social, how are we treating our employees? How are we, you know, how are we treating our, our customers and our suppliers? And, you know, many of the environments that we live in, I mean, our largest workforce is in Mexico, and, you know, the country suffered terribly during COVID. So we set up a foundation funded by our employees and some of our investors to, to help the communities in which we live in. So we're super proud. It's the second year that we've been going and, you know, we've gone some way to paying forward what, what we should be doing. If people want to find more information about the Dialyte Foundation, we'll put it in our the website in our show notes. Is that the best way, or is there another way to find out the more well, about the foundation? It's on our it's on our website as well, dialyte.com. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes as, as well for anyone who wants to learn more about that foundation, their work. One of the things that we're always curious about is how ESG connects companies with the capital markets. Yeah. So I would love to hear. Number one, how do you align your financial objectives, financial goals, and your ESG goals at Dialyte? Well, if your ESG goals actually should align perfectly with your financial goals, because you know there is a lot of studies that show, you know, companies that are very strong on the whole ESG side tend to perform much stronger on the financial side. I mean. We're a publicly traded company, but we, on the stock exchange, but we also have the Green Economy Index, which we're super proud of. We're also seeing a lot of banks now. So if you're raising money, that you will get cheaper financing if you have some ESG goals linked in with your lenders. And we hope that in the coming months, we will have our first green loan so flipping our traditional financing to a green bank loan will be slightly cheaper and the difference between the two we will donate to the Dialyte Foundation so we're we're very excited about that but you know really our investor base is invests in Dialyte because of our ESG credentials and I think any company that isn't paying attention to that side of their business and isn't working to be net zero, isn't looking after the S and the ESG will become uninvestable in I, the long term. I think that's a very interesting perspective. And I think right on to is what we're seeing as well in the long yeah. term. I think companies need to be responsible for their impacts. Absolutely. And be and in, in the meantime, you know, be, man, be managing them, and also at the same time, looking forward to all the opportunities as well that can come along with ESG. It's not just risk; it's a lot of opportunity and to be had as well. I think also when you look at the younger generation, I have a twenty-four-year-old son, and you know, he looks at some of the stuff that I uh, I do. I mean, he does tell me, "Mom, why are you still working at ten o'clock at night? Don't you have a whole team of people that do this?" And I was like, "No, <laughs> not always." But, you know, they, they, that whole generation, they want to work for a company that has 
a social conscience and, and work for a company where working there means something. And we're seeing it also, you know, not just in, in my son's generation, but in the candidates that we interview, unless a company's got a purpose and it's not just, you know, a beautifully written mission statement somewhere on their website, if they're not living and breathing those values and, and doing something that contributes to the whole, you know, climate change or the whole social side, then, then you know, they don't really want to work there. That's an excellent point. And I think a wonderful way to end this show too, and on that strong point. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Again, if people want to learn more about Dialyte and also the Dialyte Foundation, we'll put links in our show notes. So that's the, probably the easiest way to find out more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for listening to ESG Decoded. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you consume yours and follow ESG Decoded and Global Affairs Associates across social media platforms. Until our next episode, take what you learned today to drive long-term value for your organization by doing good for people and for the planet.